All right, here we go. We're in the, we're in the book of Revelation 12, starting with verse 3. It says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it may, might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the trust that you give us to have your word and to be able to read your text messages. We ask for your spirit to give us understanding as we delve into your word. Help us to see what we haven't seen before and to hear what we maybe have never heard before and to understand what we must understand moving forward. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen, amen and amen. What if I were to tell you that the Christmas story is a wartime story? A wartime story. I know, I know, we get really happy around this time of year. It's festive with all the lights, and we have the nativity scene. But we're used to seeing these kind of uh, 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 presentations during Christmas. It's peaceful. It's a silent night, right? A holy night. But according to Revelation chapter 12, there weren't just camels and cows and sheep there. There was a dragon. A real-life dragon that was like, yo, come on, Mary, push, push, you got it. A real-life dragon coaching her so that as soon as the baby was brought forth, he could devour it. Why don't we ever hear these stories? Christmas is a wartime story. In the verses we read, verse 3 in chapter 12 and verse 4, we read of this dragon with his tail that sweeps one-third of the stars out of heaven. Those stars represent who? Come on, Bible students. The angels in heaven. The angels in heaven. This dragon had the power to influence one-third of heaven, holy beings, sinless beings, that after listening to his speech, they were like, dragon, Lucifer, our vote we cast for you. Let's continue on. Verse 7, verse 7, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. There are some... Uh, that believe that Michael is just the archangel, just one of the angels. There are many in our denomination that believe that Michael is actually Jesus Christ himself. Archangel simply means leader of the angel. It doesn't necessarily mean it is an angel. And remember, the word angel is just messenger. He is the archangel. He is the leader of the messengers of God. And this archangel, Michael, in the word, in, in the Hebrew a language, Michael, me, ka, el, means who is like God. Oh, come on now. There's only one who is like God, right? Mikael means who is like God. And this leader, this leader of the angels, this leader of the heavenly host is also, we believe, the same figure that meets Joshua in the book of Joshua, right before the battle of Jericho, when this leader of the heavenly host confronts Joshua, and Joshua says, whose side are you on? He says, I'm on neither, but you are standing on holy ground right now, brother. Worship, remove your sandals, and no angel would ever receive worship in Scripture, not in the Old Testament or the New Testament. So we know this leader of the heavenly host was actually Jesus Christ himself. He was God. That is why he could he could receive worship. So there are many that, that link Michael to Jesus. And now again, there's more texts in Scripture. That's not necessarily the point of this right now. But what you do need to understand is that war broke out in heaven. War broke out in heaven. Now, Revelation is not the best book if you're trying to just follow chronology. 
if you're just wanting to say what happens next and then what happens next and then what happens next. Sometimes you have to look at it not as episodes that are in sequential order. But it is interesting to note that war breaks out in heaven after the dragon tries to devour the child. Did you guys notice that? The text has this person being born, who we believe is Jesus Christ, Jesus who is born, born in Bethlehem, and he would rule all the nations. He is the Messiah, the messianic figure. And the Bible tells us that, that after Jesus being born into this world and, and accomplishing his mission and being taken back to heaven to be with his father, we know on the right hand of the throne, of course the text we read in verse 5 says he snatched up to God and to his throne, that war breaks out in heaven. There is something that happens on planet earth with Jesus being born, living his life, dying, and resurrecting and ascending back to heaven where war breaks out. War breaks out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against uh, the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not, what's the Bible say? He was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Oh, my. Oh, my, my. So here we now know that this dragon figure in Revelation is none other than the ancient serpent that was in the tree of knowledge of good and evil all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. We now know that Satan is the adversary, the one who, who tempted Jesus in the wilderness. We now know that this figure is the one in the book of Job. In fact, the Bible tells us as we continue to read on in Revelation, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been what? Hurled down. Has been hurled down. That is Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. He has been hurled down. Wow! The one who had been standing before God accusing the brethren, the one who accused Job, the one who accuses Jesus, the one who accuses Joshua the high priest in Zechariah chapter 3, the accuser of our brethren, the one that Jesus tells Peter uh, he has asked to sift you and the rest of the disciples as if you were wheat. The one that Christ says is like a lion roaming around, waiting to see who he can devour. This figure is who Jesus battles against. And the war breaks out because of what happens here on planet Earth. So what about Jesus' first advent that made everybody so angry that war breaks out? Anybody know? Some of you are going to say maybe Satan was jealous. He was jealous that... That, that we were made in the likeness of God, that we had the ability to procreate. I actually think it has something to do with power. Think about it. Let's go back. Let's go back. It says that they fought against each other, and, 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 and we read verse 7 and 8. It says that the dragon was not strong enough. He was not strong enough and he lost his place in heaven. He was not strong enough. Question, is the battle that's waged in heaven about power? Is it about who's stronger? Is the Christmas story about who is the strongest being in the universe? Because when I was growing up, He-Man was the strongest man in the universe. Is that what this is about? Oh, you have your Bibles. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 is about to let us know how God wages war. Remember, Pastor Mark Wittes preached last Sabbath about the heavenly host that was singing on the night of Jesus' birth, that it was a battalion. It, 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 it was imagery of, of, of warriors, and yet they were singing peace on earth. That was their battle cry. 
So here is these angels, the heavenly host, and their general, the archangel, their general, Mikael, their general is born and laid in a manger. They're ready for their battle cry. They are ready to hear what their marching orders are. They are ready to take down the enemy, the dragon that was able to, 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 to manipulate one-third of heaven. They are ready to wage war. You give us our marching orders, baby Jesus. What should we do? Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says, In your relationships with one another. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Relationship with one another. Wait, the relationship with one another. Did Jesus have a relationship with Satan? Did Jesus have a relationship with Lucifer? Yes, he did. A very close relationship according to Ezekiel 28. He was a covering cherub. He, he, he dwelled in the, the throne room of God where Jesus went after his ascension. He went to the throne. That's where the covering cherub would hang out. Lucifer, morning star. In fact, the Bible even calls Jesus a morning star. They, they, they are so much alike. It's almost like looking in the mirror. In your relationships with one another, in your relationship, Jesus, with Satan, in your relationship with one-third of heaven that has fallen, Jesus, in your relationship with Rome, in your relationship with the enemies in Israel, this is the attitude that you should have. You guys ready? Who being in the very nature God, verse six, who being in the very nature, in very nature God, being in very nature God, not being like God, but being the very nature, in the very nature, he is God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It's John chapter one through three, I love that text who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God. Listen to that text, equality with God. He's not just a representation of God, he is equal to God. Jesus is God, not just the Son of God, he is God. Not just the Son of the Creator, he is the Creator, according to John chapter 1, that all things were created through him. The Bible says, being very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. He is God, yet he chooses not to use it to his advantage. He is God, but chooses not to use it to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Hello, he becomes a baby. God is ready to flex in heaven. He's ready to flex his muscles. He's going to be stronger than Satan and his host. He is ready to throw down and he decides to have an attitude adjustment. And his attitude is to become nothing. Being in the very likeness, being made into uh, human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I have a problem with this picture. I have a problem with this picture because it goes against everything that I was raised to believe about superheroes. Jesus was born during a time, according to Revelation chapter 12, where there is war being waged in heaven. There's conflict in the universe. There's a dragon there at his birth. Jesus is born during a time when Roman uh, uh, oppression was a real thing, where they ruled with an iron scepter over Israel. It was so bad when Jesus was born that even his own people, the king of his own people, tried to kill him. Jesus, the general, the war general in heaven, the leader of the heavenly host, spent his first two years on the run for his life. Jesus has to, in secrecy, many times have these conversations about him being the Messiah because he knows if Rome hears about it too early, they'll crucify him. So here is Jesus, the strongest the universe has ever seen and known, and his way of overcoming evil is not to get stronger but to get weaker. I'm sorry, this is a little bit of PTSD for me because this takes me back to a time 
when I was much younger watching my favorite superhero film of all time. Richard Donner's Superman 2. I love that movie. I would, oh wow, there's an applause. We'll both get in trouble today after the sermon. I love this movie. It would come on at 8 o'clock and, and, you know, NBC, and, and I, I had to be in bed by 9 o'clock. So my mom said, if I take a nap, I can watch the whole movie. So your brother was taking a nap. I would go to bed at 6, and I would just sleep and sleep. My mom woke us up in time for the movie. Oh, and NBC back in the day was so big with their little peacock and all these little graphics, and it was a big, you know, movie night, and oh, it was so exciting. Superman 2. For those of you who don't know, I, I, I apologize, but this, is, this might not be an example for you. I know I got in trouble with the Star Wars example, but you know what? We all have to be mature enough to handle these kind of illustrations. Amen? Amen. Jesus used illustrations and, and, and popular, you know, fan fiction. The story of Lazarus, the rich man and Lazarus, that wasn't an original story. So deal with it. So Superman by this time is known by the whole entire world as the man of steel. He's faster than a speeding bullet, right? He can leap tall buildings, not just leap them, but like fly over them. He can fly into outer space. He can, he can, he can, he can fly so fast he can actually rewind time. I mean, all this stuff. He's amazing. He's actually godlike. In fact, the, 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 the creators of Superman used Jesus as inspiration. Two Jewish guys who were you know, a little bit on the smallish side and wanted to live out a fantasy of being stronger than, than their uh, 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 compadres. And so they came up with this character of Superman. He is sent from a distant planet. He's the only son. And he comes to this world and, and he's a savior of sorts. And most of the films on Superman all try to, 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 to pull at these little pieces from scripture. They all have these messianic messages, all of the Superman films. And so there's an inspiration here. And so, but the great part about it is, is that Superman is invulnerable. He can do all the things anyone could ever imagine to do. The heat vision, the super breath, all of that stuff. And he has the character to match. Oh, such a good guy. Saves cats in the tree. But Superman 2 was scary because there were three villains from his home planet of Krypton that came from the Phantom Zone and they came to planet Earth and they were just as strong as Superman and it was three against one. I was terrified as a kid. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Don't worry, don't worry. Superman, in my mind, will be strong enough. I was seven years old. Battle tested. Strength always wins. Don't worry, Superman, you have the red cape. They're all dressed in black. Problem. The problem I never saw coming. I couldn't understand it because I was seven years old. A huge problem. There was something far more dangerous than the three villains from Krypton. There were, there, there were someone far more dangerous than Lex Luthor. There was... I told you I had PTSD. Something that made Superman weaker than kryptonite. Lois Lane. Oh, Superman fell in love with Lois. Took her to the Fortress of Solitude and says, I want to be with Lois forever, but I want to be like Lois. Oh, Ugh. And with this Kryptonian technology, he could step into a chamber and, and, and he could reverse his powers and become human. That's exactly what he does for love. How could you give up all of that power for a person? And of course, Lois, like all of you girls, is like, oh, it's so sweet. He loves me. So selfish. Not thinking about all the other boys and girls and cats that need to be saved. And the first time he takes her out to eat on their first human date, 
Those of you who know the film know what happened. Somebody bullies him, and he ends up with a bloody lip. Was it worth it, Superman? Was it worth it? This text reminds me of that film. God understands that the world is in trouble. It's in peril. He understands that the dragon and the serpent is on the prowl. He understands that he wants us dead. And instead of getting stronger and bigger, he gets smaller and weaker. There's a huge sin problem in the world. And instead of Jesus saying, this looks like a job for... This looks like a job for Clark Kent. This looks like a job job for Clark Kent. No, we need the red cape. We need the S insignia. We need the red boots. We need you to be strong. And God says, here I am, Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter of the Daily Planet, who pretends to be a human, except Jesus does something worse. He doesn't just pretend to be a human. He becomes a human. He's not bulletproof. He's not even nail-proof. And yet, this is how God chooses to rescue us. I told you that Revelation is not in chronological order. It's such an interesting book. But Revelation chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5 tells us that something happens. And this is at the, um, actually, let's, let's go, back to, go back to Philippians. Let's read Philippians. Let's finish reading Philippians here first. It says that after he humbled himself uh, to the point of death, death on a cross, Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says there, this, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should what? Every knee should bow. Where? In heaven and on where, where was their war? War was where? Where did the Bible tell us that war was? There was war in heaven. He says that every knee shall, should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He's, he's talking about Hades now. He's talking about under the He's talking about the grave. He's talking about Sheol. He's saying that, that, that even under the earth, that everyone would bow, everyone would worship, every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 5. So this is what happens when Jesus decides to show up as Clark Kent and give his life as a ransom for many. This is what happens. Revelation 5 gives us this picture. Now watch this. This is, this is, this is going to really make you smile. It says in Revelation 5, uh, John is looking for the person who can open up the scrolls, right? I, I, boy, one of these days, probably in year 5, year 5, I'll, I'll do a Revelation series. You're not ready for it yet, and I don't want to get fired yet. So here's go. In Revelation 5, in Revelation 5, it's, John is looking, he's looking for someone who can open up these scrolls. Then one of the elders, verse 5, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep, see the lion of the tribe of Judah. Oh, who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? Jesus. Oh, can you see the red cape? Oh, he's strong. He's big. The lion of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. Everybody wants to follow a lion. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then, he, no, he heard, he heard that it was the lion, right? He heard that it was the lion. But then the Bible says, then he saw a lamb. <laughs> he heard it was Superman, but he saw Clark Kent. He heard it was a lion, the lion of Judah, the root of David. He heard it was, but then when he looked, he saw that it was a lamb. And not just any lamb, but a lamb that had been slain standing at the center of the throne and circled by the four living creatures and elders. The lamb had seven hordes and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Oh, I, can I just give you a preview of this Revelation series like five years from now? 
that spirit, those spirits, the spirits, that number seven, those spirits that leave the throne room of God and go to the earth, I believe this is actually Pentecost. I believe this is Pentecost. I'm not the only one that believes this. Trust me, there are Adventist scholars that say the same thing. It's written in books, so you can't get, be angry with me. We have our theologians in the seminary that are saying the same thing, and one of them taught me this and opened my eyes to something I had never seen before. This is the spirit going down to the earth, what the disciples were waiting for, because the lion of, of, of Judah had triumphed. He's now in the throne room of God, so now the spirit can be unleashed. As Jesus had said, I must go so that I can send the spirit. And so the Bible says in verses 11 and 13, then I looked up and heard a voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. Oh, this is the heavenly host here, Pastor Mark. This is, the hev- this is the army. This is the army right here. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, worthy is the what? The lamb, oh, not the lion. Worthy is the lamb. They finally have bought into it. They don't need Superman with the red cape. They're good with Clark Kent. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And for those of you that struggle with praise music and all the repetition, you would hate the throne room of God. They can't stop saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. It's a broken record, but it's a hit record. The Bible says that they're praising God, and then I heard every creature in heaven. How many creatures? Every creature in heaven. That means that every being that God had ever created, every creature in heaven. Where was their war? Where was war? It was in heaven. That means that Satan and his host were there as well. Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea. Oh, man, there's so much imagery there. I don't have time to unpack it right now. And all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise, honor, and glory, and power forever and ever. When the Bible says in chapter 6 that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. When it says it in Isaiah, when it tells us that in Romans, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. All of heaven, all of the creatures are worshiping. That includes Satan himself. Something happens at Calvary. Something happens at Calvary according to Colossians. We're closing. Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 and 20 says, For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, all things. A few things, just the things that believe, all things, whether things on earth or things where? Or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Oh, what is the message the heavenly host sings? Peace on earth, good will towards men. The peace that was on earth was the peace that heaven was also clamoring for. There was peace in the universe. Jesus did something by becoming Clark Kent, by becoming the lamb that would secure peace throughout the known universe. And why is that family? Because this great controversy, this battle between good and evil will not be won because God is stronger. It's won because God is weaker. He chooses to be weaker. He chooses to be weaker because the issue in heaven, the war in heaven, isn't about who's stronger. If it was about who's stronger, God would not have sent his son Here as a baby, he would have sent him here as Superman with the red cape where where Roman Empire and all of the nations would not be able to overcome him. If it's an issue of power, he could have shown up as a 50-foot giant. If it's an issue about who's stronger, even the demons know and tremble. The great controversy, the battle between good and evil, God and Satan, isn't about who's stronger. It's not about strength of muscle. It's about strength of character. Is God good or not? Is God love or not? Is God who he says he is 
or is he a liar? And even in the end, even in the end, in this throne room scene in Revelation, even Satan has to do. I, I got to give you your... One of our favorite authors, Ellen White, says in Great Controversy that at the end of time, as, as all of the world sees in a panoramic view Earth's history, that even Satan himself, she, she says, Ellen White says her, her exact words, is constrained to worship. He can't help it. Even for Satan, the dragon, he just says, you're good. <laughs> you are good. God isn't trying to win our trust through his muscle. He's trying to win our trust through his heart. And although Superman and Clark Kent have the same heart, God knew that the might of Superman would have people worshiping him for the wrong reasons, following him for the wrong reasons, and he didn't want them to follow because he's bigger, he's stronger, he's faster. He wanted people to follow and trust him because he is good. The Christmas story is a war story, but it's not a war that is won through swords and spears and shields. It's a war that's won with God's heart, vulnerable and bleeding. Now when I look back at that film, I'm not angry with Superman for being in love with Lois. I get it. Superman love makes us do some crazy things. It makes us vulnerable and weak, submissive. So as Paul says, in your relationships with one another, have this same mind that was in Christ Jesus, who did not use his equality with God something to be used to his advantage. But pastor, I'm right, and I'm stronger, and I make more money, and I have more experience. And God says, great, let go of that and be like me. But they'll think I'm a doormat and they'll, and they'll think they can just walk all over me. I know, I know. Stop trying to win the battles and let's win the war. Be like me. Be like me. Christmas is a war story. It does involve bloodshed, but not yours. He wins, and everybody sees it, including the dragon. Father God, thank you so much for the challenge that you've given us again. Oh, every knee bows, every tongue confesses, Everyone in heaven and in earth and below the earth, below all, worship you. You're that good. You're that good. So here we are. In this moment, we worship you. You are the light of this world. You came into this world of darkness and you showed us another way. You let us see your heart. And you've won us over. So may we have the same mind that is also in Christ Jesus. We will not use power, manipulation, control, influence, none of it. We're going to just be like you. And let that be enough. Thank you for being our Superman. In Jesus' name, amen.